Today I'm joined by Ross Ashcroft, co-founder of Renegade Inc. and a broadcaster. Thanks Ross for joining us. Pleasure, good to be here. Now your film uh, Four Horsemen exposed how the financial system has basically been manipulated by a um, financial political elite uh, to benefit themselves at the expense of the, most of the people. Now why is it that, that most people don't really understand this? Firstly, I don't think it's conspiracy. I don't think that there's somebody, uh, you know, in a cave stroking a cat um, and, and pulling the levers. I think what we have is a structurally determined economic behaviour. And that comes from the economic ideology that we all, I think, uh, labour under, which is this neoliberalism. So people don't understand it because neoliberalism is beautifully formless. Um, and uh, people kind of make up the economic doctrine, if you like, as, as they go along. Not a lot of people want to sit down and really understand the, the, the mechanics of, uh, of neoliberalism because it's a dull thing to work out. But where it touches people in their everyday lives, for example, with the cost of housing, yeah. it's vitally important to understand it. Could you run me through the process by which money creation by banks has actually push, pushed up the cost of housing for people? Yeah, well, if house prices are going up and if all the in economic indicators are going up, no one's really got any incentive to question the economic system. We've got a point now where that's no longer the case because a lot of people are, are locked out of housing markets, a lot of people pay way over the odds for rent, and a lot of people are paying way over the odds for capital purchase of housing. And the reason for that is that because banks, private banks, create money out of thin air and, and fire it at an asset class, and the easiest asset class to fire it at over the last economic cycle has been housing. And the reason why we've relied on rising house prices is because wages haven't gone up to the same capacity as house prices, or in, in the same sort of ratio, if you like. So people need the capital gains of, of, a, of a house, uh, to augment their wages, which are slipping, uh, uh, when prices generally in the economy are going up. And that's why it's been so easy for uh, private banks to create credit, fire it at that asset class, and us not ask too many questions about it. But you don't think that, that media um, misinformation plays any part in that? Or? There is some misinformation, but I think a lot of it really is selective amnesia. Uh, it's that you just don't look at this and you say, well, why don't we start talking about the root causes as opposed to the triage? You know, uh, why don't we look at what's really going on as opposed to what you're saying on the surface? Um, and sadly, there isn't a um, desire within those media organisations to do a kind of root and branch on, uh, on how the economy actually works, which is ironic because, you know, we've said for a long time that if these ideas can stand up to scrutiny, then we should, you know, give them the kind of scrutiny they need because they're robust and they're bulletproof. Turns out they're not. And in practical terms, are you working on any programs that we should be looking at? Yeah, we're, so we're working with Steve Keane, um, who once again has been uh, you know, heralded as the forecaster of the year by the Sydney Morning Herald in Australia, uh, and is, is persistently good uh, when it comes down to analysing this current e economic system. We're also working with our partners at Independent Thinking on education and how to navigate a faltering Western education system. And then also working uh, with on a lot of audio content weekly for our subscribers so we can uh, get at the hard to find stories, if you like, uh, uh, because we know that people are really interested in that kind of context, not just factual reporting, but why, things, why these things are happening and why these mega trends are coming into play at this time. And do you agree with Steve Keane that private debt and the, the level of it is the main problem that's, that's causing economic stagnation? Uh, undoubtedly. And the metaphor really is, you know, if you've got a bonfire and, and you're throwing damp leaves on it, uh, that's what you're doing all the time when you're peddling debt. And um, ultimately, that debt will have to be restructured or written off because uh, you cannot uh, drive an economy, a debt fueled economy, with more debt. Eventually, it falls over a cliff. And it's, it's very obvious that that happens. It's just when. We're getting to a point now where we uh, can see huge overcapacity uh, in London, in the housing market. How many times have you seen the word luxury and, and the word housing? And pretty much everywhere. Um, and, and this is what's called the scar tissue, some people call the scar tissue, that private debt leaves, which is just pumping. And China is a classic example of it. Ghost cities, you know, just pumping the economy full of credit, building uh, things to whatever they may be, all-seater stadiums right through to luxury penthouses, to unlock the land value bank that and move on to the next thing, that is not a sustainable way to run an economy. Regarding the role of austerity, what's your view on, on what's been, been happening in Greece um, over the last few days? We've always called austerity backdoor privatisation. Uh, what's just happened in Greece is front door, it's take the front of the house off 
privatization and let everybody openly see that what you're doing is basically um, uh, common, uh, well, it, it's conquest. But the other point um, uh, on is that nobody really did the due diligence on Greece. And when private banks were lending all that money, no one really looked at Greece and said, you know, can these people pay this back? Do they have the tax base necessary to be able to do so? Not really. Uh, the money that's being shipped in from various organisations, what's that being used for? Is it infrastructure spending or is it actually being used to pay key workers? And the answer was the latter. Well, you know that if that money's just dripping into or, 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 or uh, being scattergunned, if you like, around an economy, you're never going to be able to see that back. The people who've really got away with this are the private banks who uh, didn't do the due diligence necessary, which have now, and they're often French and German, have la land landed the French and German taxpayer with the bill. And those are the people who we should be talking about, not uh, lazily stereotyping the Greeks. The real issue here is who did that due diligence and who also hid Greece's debt to get them into the uh, Eurozone in the first place. I heard that it was Goldman Sachs that helped them do that. Yeah, I think the woman uh, who headed the deal was named today in one of the uh, British papers. Um, but um, she's got some questions to answer. But again, as, you, as you've said, uh, the, the Greek people didn't see very much of that money. My understanding is that the clique that were in power at the time squandered it. The people get, you know, get the bill, essentially. The money that's been, that the Greeks have got has gone to pay the banks um, in Germany and France, uh, is my understanding. So, but you don't, would never know that just to watch mainstream media. Well, no, the, the depth of the analysis isn't there. Um, but thankfully, enough people aren't uh, watching a lot of mainstream media. Um, and the reason is that they're feeling uh, in some way duped uh, because they're only getting a third of the, or a fifth of the story. Yeah, I'm truly shocked about Greece because I saw Tariq Ali questioning a couple of weeks ago and I was thinking, it's a bit premature to be questioning the, the Syriza that they've got the the um, referendum coming up, uh, and it looks like they'll get a mandate to to stay, to stay strong. But I think maybe he's seen it too many times before. But, but some somebody came in, and I don't exactly. I still don't understand why exactly they, they've done it like that. Why people? Why they caved in? Yeah, I, I just I think they've capitulated. Um, but then the question is, do the Greek people then allow them? To, to enact this, because fundamentally what they're saying is, you know, we're going to give all these state assets over to Germany and France, pretty much. The rent seekers have won, and we're going to sit here and accept it. Well, I, I don't see the Greeks sitting there and accepting it. Maybe the Greek people won't, but then if the political class has been pretty much co-opted, they'll be able to use a machinery of state against the people. That's true. That's true. And, it, and the question there is, you know, what's at, what's at stake? And what's at stake is basically the Eurozone. So, you know, the, the, this is the, it's ironic, isn't it, in the, in the birthplace of democracy? That is the irony. That you get this kind of economic fascism and everybody blames lazy Greeks in inverted commas. No one ever looks at the private banks who did the deals in the first place and asks, and asks who did the due diligence. No one ever asks who hid the debt. No one ever asks, well, you know, was the bonus structure in those banks uh, set up in a way that they had to lend that money or were, were encouraged to lend that money because then they could unlock all sorts of, you know, personal uh, uh, um, remuneration. No one really asked that. And that's, that's really the case. That's what actually happened. And, and the culprits have long left the scene and left uh, the Greek people holding this massive liability. It seems like, if just from what little research I, I, I do in my own private time, it's like a cesspool of corruption at it the is. heart of Europe now. I think you're right. I think, it's, I think this is very much, and, and, and by the way, this is what happens at the end of most economic cycles, this level of corruption and you know, leaders who think that they can get away with it and, and uh, steal a march and you know, they get pretty jealous. Of, uh, uh, it's, it's Rome. It, it's the sort of Rome. I like that analogy in Falls. It, when it's yeah, it is Rome. And um, people don't, leaders don't serve the people anymore. They serve themselves. Um, and you can see that, you know, and, and you can see the revolving door. Uh, uh, look at Goldman's hands uh, and like, all over this. Draghi was part of this unit when they lent the money. He's ex-Goldman, isn't he? He's ex-Goldman. He's now head of the ECB. But in fact, nearly all of the people running the show seem to be ex-Goldman. Yeah, they do. Like and and that, that tells you everything you need to know. Everyone thinks that the city of London is a wealth creation vehicle. And it isn't. But it, it, it creates money. And, and moves money around, and money isn't wealth. 
And I think that once you've made that differentiation between money and wealth, you can start to think differently about the economy because then it brings value in as well. And at the moment, what we're getting is hugely you know, overpriced um, valuations on startups because there's so much money in the system. Uh, and and you know, when you ask about the value in those startups, there's not very much of it. So if you wind back and say, well, what's the difference between money and wealth? Money can be created out of thin air and lent at interest, which is what happens in our economy at the moment, uh, fundamentally as debt. Wealth is a product, a service, or, or, uh, or some uh, kind of uh, life-enhancing um, product that, that actually exists in the real economy. And what we, what we haven't done is divorce the real economy from the banking sector or, or the, uh, the shadow economy, if you like, um, and, and then uh, we, 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 we think that the banking sector in the middle of the real economy is going to deliver all these riches. Well, that just simply isn't the case. This is parasite and host. And um, the beauty about this parasite, if you will, uh, is that it's disguised itself so brilliantly in the host that people think that actually that's the wealth creation vehicle, when actually totally the opposite is the case. Every time I'm travelling on an antiquated tube system, I'm thinking, you spend hundreds of billions of pounds bailing out banks who don't actually do that much productive for the overall economy. And here are all the people on the tube sweating and, and sick to see the faces of the person sitting next to them. It can't go on like this for, for that much longer. I don't think it can. I think people are starting to get wise to this. Um, and they are understandably asking for better conditions. You know, if you look at zero hours contracts in the UK, that's a disaster. That's an absolute disaster. And it's unfair to ask workers to uh, put themselves in such a volatile position, especially when they're trying to bring up their families. Uh, and, and it's also unfair to decry the standards of society when you're peddling economic measures that you know create the kind of uncertainty that, that means people are, are volatile, do become volatile. So you can't have it both ways. And I think that what's happened uh, certainly at the end of this economic cycle is instead of doing the heavy lifting of actually talking to the, the public and explaining, really explaining what's going on, people have just gone for the short-term fix of four-year parliaments and you know what, kick the can down the road and hopefully it explode on the next guy's watch or the next girl's watch. But we, we're, we're kind of running out of time. And I think, you know, a lot of very, very mainstream uh, types, head of HSBC, uh, that, as in their head of their economic union, their senior economist Stephen King has come out and said, you know, no, when, when the uh, global economy runs off the rails again, there aren't any lifeboats left. Um, so people are starting to so sound that alarm. And we should not be surprised. And we shouldn't buy into the media surprise uh, when that uh, next shudder hits, because it's inevitable. Now, now people here look at Greece and, and, and think, oh, it couldn't happen here. But, but it nearly did seven years ago. Yeah. And, and isn't it the case that, that um, saving the banks here in the UK essentially meant that the taxpayer became liable for all those debts? Yeah, and um, it, that's simply the case. And do you think that's go it's going to continue? Well, when do, what do you think it would take to, for people here to wake up and see uh, the, the way that the, the system operates? Another recession, perhaps? We have an amazing thing in the UK, um, which is our ability for uh, denial, basically. Because everybody knows that in 08, no fundamental economic problem was solved. What did you think of the budget that we had recently from George Osborne? Brilliant piece of politics. Terrible piece of economic uh, mismanagement. But what do you think will be the effect on the, the UK in, in two or three years' time? Well, hopefully he'll become Prime Minister and then on his watch the whole thing will blow up and he's got nowhere to run. One shocking thing I find is that the Labour Party is offering no proper critique of the policies before the election or, and subsequently. The fact that the Labour Party are going along with it means that they don't want to sit down and do the really difficult thinking and work out a really viable economic solution. Because think about it, if you've got such, amount, such massive amounts of private debt in, in the UK at the moment, which you have, and then suddenly the government stops spending as well, then you've got, you've got the, the perfect economic disaster. And in terms of your own personal investing, well, do you invest and if so, what in? I do, businesses. I, I like growing businesses, um, and uh, and I like uh, because I don't want to ever be in a position where I'm paying into a pension and I have no clue who's looking after that pension, uh, and certainly not now. 
uh, or I don't want to be putting uh, speculative bets on markets that where I'm not in control of, of what's actually going on. If I get it wrong in a business, I take fundamental responsibility for it, uh, and it, and you know you, it keeps you sharp. Uh, if uh, if I get it right, then I, and with the teams that we're working with, then we take the upside. And I think there's an amount of accountability in that which makes me or allows me to rest easy at night. Thanks very much for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.